Welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick mm-hmm. O'Brien podcast, where we're reading through the novels of Patrick O'Brien and the adventures of Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matron. You're with Mike. And with Ian. As we continue through The Surgeon's Mate. Ian, can you tell us a little bit about where we were, where we're headed? Well, at long last, it seems, we're headed to sea, Mike. Oh. In our last episode, oh, we had Jack and Stephen and Diana. I think, Mike, that our characters are pretty much riding their luck on land. Jack is really badly conflicted by the news that he's being blackmailed by Miss Smith. Stephen is still inching towards being married to Diana and navigating the byways of what's going on in the world of intelligence and European politics. Meanwhile, there's this situation brewing in the Baltic coast, which we think might be where our heroes are headed, but we're still not sure exactly when and exactly how. So meanwhile, meanwhile, Mike, we're in Ashgrove Cottage. And I think we're going to start this week with Jack at Ashgrove Cottage feeling pretty low and feeling like a bit of a heel. I think that's exactly where we find him in. We find out that he's been intercepting the Ashgrove Cottage mail every day, really worried about these continuing letters coming from Miss Smith. And he's thinking, O'Brien even lets us know, that he's had a number of affairs over the years, but they've always been with women of like mind. But Miss Smith seems to appear to be pursuing this more romantically, romantically with a vengeance somehow. And and Jack is feeling pretty low about this. O'Brien tells us the necessary subterfuge and concealment were extremely distasteful to him. And the possible the probable advent of a noisy, enthusiastic, hysterical Miss Smith was a stark nightmare. But what grieved him most was the change in his relationship with Sophie. He could not talk to her with his usual complete openness. The deceit and the small ignoble lies set him apart. He felt extremely lonely, sometimes quite desolate. And in any case, he was no good at lying. He did it clumsily, and the doing filled him with anger. This fills us a bit, I think, a a bit with empathy. Not a massive amount of empathy, but a bit of empathy for Jack. His childish, boyish, blustering sexual adventures have got him to the point where there's loads of his life, his his stability is at risk. And I think he's also realizing that the, the deception and the dissembling that Stephen goes through is something that's surprisingly hard to carry with you. And it's a really touching moment for me when Jack is reading the latest of the letters from Miss Smith. He's in one of these empty brick outhouses built by this projector, Kimber, looking for an abortive lead mine. And Stephen shows up and Jack's got this guilty start as he kind of whips the wet letter away and turns around and looks guilty. And Stephen says, why, brother, one would think that you entertained the local nymphs in this forbidding bower, which is (laughs) really, I don't think he's being sarcastic. That's just a joke. And it's, it's as, as Brian says, it's just badly timed. Such guilty consternation, he says, I have rarely seen. And Stephen reveals that Sophie knows damn well where Jack is. Doesn't, she doesn't know what he's doing, I don't think. And she doesn't know the truth about the letters, but she knows that something's amiss with Jack and she knows for sure that that's where he goes and hides out. But Sophie's had that insight, I think, into Jack's, <laughs> Jack's evasions before. But, oh my gosh. Yeah, you're so right. It, we just saw Jack come home and he's so desperately longing for that connection that he used to miss because he was set apart from the crew. He wanted it with Sophie and they had it for that one brief shining moment for my Camelot throwback here as he gets home. And now because of these letters and Jack's guilt, probably warranted, it's tough. It's really hard. But luckily, Stephen, Stephen is back here. Yeah, I, I think we've been in this situation before, haven't we? Stephen shows up with the promise of a ship. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Go for it. Stephen is announcing to Jack, Stephen's on the way to London, wants to know if Jack already has a ship or whether Jack wants to have his name put forward for this risky mission to intervene at Grimm's home. This is the island in the Baltic where there's a Catalan army holding the island on behalf of Bonaparte, but we think that they could be subverted if only a trustworthy Catalan person could put them in the right mind about what's really going on with Bonaparte. England have already sent one emissary there. They lost the ship and they lost all hands to a well-fortified battery and to some bad weather. Jack then is off 
to visit the Admiralty and Stephen and he travel into London together and a little chink of light, I think, Mike, in the dialogue for Jack, we get a little tiny Aubreyism. They eat snacks in the chaise and they go together to stay at the grapes in the Savoy and they uh, they tell themselves that they will kill three birds at one blow. A little tiny Aubreyism there for the fans. They have this conversation in the chase. It's only Stephen and Jack. And Stephen's kind of wondering, why did Jack want to get on a ship so quick? Why was he willing to take this risky mission? Get me out of here. I'd be you know, so grateful to you for it. And he finds out he's not fleeing over dad because he was thinking, well, maybe this Kimber thing's accelerated. But Jack brings him completely up to date on Miss Smith, who is threatening to come over. Jack even says, you know, Stephen, don't call me a scrub. I know I'm a scrub. Thinks that Stephen's going to think less of him. And Stephen, I love how Stephen replies. He says, you know, I'm not concerned with the moral issue, but rather what might be usefully done. And Stephen confesses to himself that he's a little surprised that Jack, who has got a man of great physical courage, has what Stephen calls such an abject degree of moral cowardice. But Stephen thinks, wait a minute. I'm not married. I don't know anything about domestic warfare at first hand. I don't know about the stakes involved, the crushing nature of either defeat or victory, and the extraordinarily powerful emotions that might come into play. And he remembers that even though he loves Sophie, he, Stephen, he's long deplored the jealous, possessive side of her character. Stephen then starts musing about marriage. And a while ago, a couple episodes ago, we were talking about O'Brien's reflections on marriage, Stephen's reflections on marriage, so many reflections. We kind of had our bean jar to say every time we kind of come down on marriage a little bit, we'll throw a bean in and take it out when Stephen and Diane are happy together. Stephen comes to an interesting conclusion here. He says, monogamy seems to be the only solution at last, although in a way it's as absurd as monarchy. Which is a really kind of ass backwards way of saying it. I think marriage is a good idea. Right. But he's got there by this really pessimistic downbeat line of thinking. Ah, he's such an enlightenment guy. <laughs> such a not romantic. <laughs> it's funny because back when he was, you know, arguing the cause of monarchy, he was saying, you know, no, it makes no sense at all. However, we build cathedrals. We do great things under monarchy, which we don't do on the more rational way. And maybe he thinks that in monogamy, we, we rise to do great things. I don't know, but fascinating observation there. And I was also struck by the reference to marriage as a kind of warfare. And we're going to hear from another character, I think, in a, in a, in a short while about the idea of a relationship between a man and a woman as being like warfare. And this is something that I don't know exactly where it comes from in O'Brien's thinking and his character, but it's clearly not an accident that he's teased out this uh, this reference. We've also got a passing reference to Muslims and Jews, and I think we're going to have a few more faith-based <laughs> references and jokes as the, as the chapter goes on. O'Brien's going to show us this <laughs> skeptic versus a romantic discussion playing out, I think, between Jack and Stephen. Um, Jack tells Stephen that he's been sending Miss Smith money. Oh, foolish man. He's been sending Miss Smith money, plans to send more because that's what you do with a blackmailer, right? You keep sending them more money. But I think it's again, you know, Jack hasn't got perspective. He hasn't got insight really into what's going on with Miss Smith. And Stephen tells him that this could be a false pregnancy. Even if it is real, she might not carry to term. And that, and maybe this is what we're all thinking these days, Miss Smith might be deceiving Jack, like the, the Puget Sound Debs in an officer and a gentleman, that maybe the demands for money are just her out for the main chance. And Jack's really upset by this suggestion. And he says, oh, you know, I know this woman. I know her. That wouldn't be her character. But Mike, I think Stephen's, Stephen's having nothing to do with that, that idea. No, 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 no. <laughs> Stephen says that he may know her in the biblical sense, but he really knows nothing about her otherwise. And he talks about her reputation and everything. And, and you know, Jack has told him that this was a blackguard thing to say. And, and Stephen says, well, you know, it's a blackguard world, especially with somebody you know, that has her kind of reputation. We don't know where this is going to go because all of a sudden Jack realizes, ah, wait, wait, we're already at London Bridge. And, and they curtail, as we like to say in the canon, the conversation. So a bit of relief, a bit of relief. I think that we're in London in the grapes. We love the grapes. We love Mrs. Broad and the serving girls. We love the fact that Stephen's in the in the world of London society. I guess he's within distance of Diana, although it's not obviously his intention immediately to go see Diana. And he's within range of Sir Joseph Blaine as well and the world of intelligence 
and the quite deep, I think, friendship and mutual esteem that he and Blaine have for each other. Yeah, as a matter of fact, he heads right off to see Sir Joseph Blaine. And and Stephen has in mind taking over the failed Ponsish assignment that we've been talking about here on Grin's Home. When he sees Sir Joseph, he learns that it's, in fact, more important than ever. If they can take Grimm's home, they could convince additional allies to join Great Britain It's in the fight against Napoleon. They could get a great strategic advantage, this ability to cut off the French left wing from behind. But they've looked at what it would take militarily to take this thing straight out by force. And... So Joseph just confesses that given the demands of the American war, of their requirements all around the world, they, they don't have the time, they don't have the ships to take the island by siege. It's going to have to be intrigue and diplomacy to get this thing done. And they know that Stephen is the man for the job. Of course, Stephen doesn't have to be convinced. He's signing up. Yeah. And th- this is the situation that's been Stephen's sweet spot in many, many campaigns in the past. You know, we want to avoid bloodshed. We want to avoid a big upheaval. Let's see if we can, <laughs> let's see if some maneuvering can do what brute force can't do. And Stephen is the guy for this. Absolutely. And if it helps free Catalan, all the better. We're also going to start to hear about somebody who I have a bit of a soft spot for, and he's going to be a really great secondary character because Sir Joseph starts telling Stephen about a young Lithuanian cavalry officer who's been loaned from the Swedish service and has been doing some work on intelligence around the the island, speaks the Baltic languages, speaks English and French. And Blaine then carries on to fill Stephen in on what's going on on the island, how it's controlled by three Catalan independence forces and the French are sending in a new commander. And we also hear, introduction at second hand to another interesting secondary character, that the Catalan force that's in charge of the island is commanded by Ramon de la Strette, who is nothing less than Stephen's godfather. Yes. <laughs> go Stephen. Now, go Stephen, especially when not many chapters or not many books ago, we, we were bemoaning the fate of the bastard of the illegitimate man. Right. But now, never mind your natural parentage, you know, Stephen's, uh, Stephen's faith parentage is helping him out here. So that's really great. So Stephen's godfather is Ramon de la Strette. And we hear that Stephen really admires Ramon's courage and honor and generosity, tainted a little bit with some vanity and some, some I think he calls it headstrong foolishness, someone who wants to lead and to be a great figure among men. So here we have it. There's going to be a helping hand from this Lithuanian. We're going to go out there and somehow negotiate or make common cause with this vainglorious but noble and brave <laughs> Catalan general. Now, Mike, a couple of episodes ago, we were saying this story's taking a little while to get going, but now I can hear the the ratcheting of the spring winding up as there's characters and interest and action where we're off, I think. Right, right. And we're getting little bits and pieces assembled here, personnel, a bit of logistics. Stephen also learns that the island has supplies to hold out for a month, so they can't just cut it off and starve them, but they're short of tobacco and wine, a real delicacy to the Catalans there on the island. So Blaine is just so delighted that Stephen is willing to take this on. And Stephen says to Sir Joseph that he would rather sail if he's going to take this mission on with Jack. And Joseph is also (laughs) delighted because they had sent an inexperienced captain the first time, and they think that's one of the reasons they were blown out of the water. Now, Stephen does let them know that they've got to be very careful here. They've got to respect the pride of the Catalan forces. And Stephen, in order to take this job, wants assurances that the forces there will be treated with the highest respect transported home fully armed with honors if they agree to to turn over the island and and effectively switch sides to come away from France and to come over to England. Which leaves open a nice little bit of jeopardy there. You know, headstrong, proud general needs to be treated delicately and given uh, given honor and respect. There's room for some things to go wrong there. Right. What could happen? But anyway, Mike, we get this interesting turn now as Stephen and Blaine have a long rambling conversation into the, the late hours. And suddenly Blaine turns to Stephen and says, I want to consult you as a physician. Right. And we, we talked an episode or two ago about the slight ambiguity <laughs> about the, the sexual and gender preferences of Sir Joseph Blaine. And we discover that Sir Joseph 
is contemplating getting married and is, how can we put this delicately, aware of a certain want of vigor, a certain debility. And it wouldn't be a delicate subject if O'Brien didn't find a way to get his characters to dress it up in classical quotes. So we get a reference to a Horace poem um, and a man offering up his, quotes, tools to Venus. And this is clearly something that Blaine feels very uncomfortable raising, but also he would perhaps value some practical advice from a medical man. Right, right. He's sort of wondering, you know, is this Vashon, is there anything you can do about this? Or it's just as natural with aging. And Stephen says, no, 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 it's not inevitable with age. And he cites a lot of examples, even in their pre-Viagra age. And <laughs> Stephen, Stephen then asks his friend, and not just as a doctor, but his friend, is it really wise to be cured of this disability? And he provides a number of literary references supporting impotence, even self-castration. <laughs> you know, we talk about Horace said Confucius. Confucius reported on reaching a point where his heart no longer moved him to transgress the moral law. He talks about Origen, you know, one of the early church fathers in, in Christendom, you know, who actually cut off his offending member to return to purer contemplations undisturbed. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Ouch. I think, although we've we've drifted into, wouldn't you be better off without it? I think Sir Joseph is genuinely wanting to be able to <laughs> to to get his ardor back for marriage rather than just sacrifice it. He's not willing to just go along with Stephen in his right no. in his kind of biz, bizarre philosophical self abnegation thing. And he says he he feels that his spring of life might be missing. He says I had no conception of its importance. You are younger than I am, Maturin, and it may be that you do not know from experience that the absence of a torment may be a worse torment still. You may wish to throw a hair shirt aside, not realizing that it was the hair shirt alone that keeps you warm. A Nessus's shirt might be more apt, said Stephen, quite unheard. <laughs> so this was new to me. I think I get the idea of the hair shirt and John the Baptist. Mike, help us out with a Nessus's shirt. What's going on there? Nessus tried to steal, uh, and in some stories, rape Hercules' wife. Uh, he's, he's actually the centaur who is taking people across the river. Hercules and his wife uh, come along. He's taking the wife, and Hercules sees that he's making off with her and takes one of his arrows, which has been dipped in the poison blood of the hydra oh. that Hercules had s slew earlier, and um, zigs him with his arrow. And while he's dying, Nessus convinces Hercules' wife to take this poison-covered shirt that he has on, now mixed with his blood and the hydras, and that she should use it any time to be sure that Hercules remains faithful to her. And later, sometime later in his life, when Hercules starts to stray, she remembers, takes out this shirt, and sends it to Hercules. And when he puts it on, the poison burns through his skin, killing him. So Stephen's reference is this, this shirt that you think might keep you warm might be the death of you too. Right? Yeah, and I wonder if also he's making a bit of a fling at Jack and a little sarcastic put down sotto voce in the direction of Joseph Blaine. He's <laughs> probably also a bit of a reference to Jack Aubrey pierced with his own member. Hmm. And I love the fact that they get onto the, the St. Augustine quote, <laughs> who prayed for the gift of chastity, but added, but not yet, O oh Lord. <laughs> And, and these guys, I mean, I, I just love how literary these characters are and how and that Brian makes them, you know, St. Joseph refutes uh, Stephen saying, you know, you remember Origen's gesture was condemned by the Second Council of Constantinople. <laughs> so Joseph's not having any of this idea of kind of stoic peace. And it seems to him that this peace that Matthew is talking about sounds a bit like death. After all, he notes, we are all stoics in the grave and finally rejects the idea of Confucius's stoicism saying, if Confucius had ever met Miss Blenkinsop, who was the object of his affection, if Confucius had ever met Miss Blenkinsop, he would never have said such a thing. And you and you kind of wonder, Stephen, who we think is still contemplating marriage with Diana, having these strong feelings in this direction. It's, it's a little odd, right? <laughs> Anyhow, so we've done we've done relationship counseling <laughs> and uh and, and androgen therapy <laughs> for Sir Joseph. And having talked the night away, a surprise, surprise, Stephen's not up and about early the next morning, is he? No, 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 no. He's sleeping in. Jack can't kind of rouse him. So you know, Jack makes his way to the Admiralty on his own. 
And he's come in to talk about his claims to the Voxham height which you know he still hasn't gotten paid for and he feels like he needs this money to keep paying Miss Smith plus all of his money is tied up and and he wants to know what's going on here and it turns out that the money and the honors are being held up he's told by this sort of functionary that he's meeting with due to questions from higher ups and we're wondering is this you know who is this Mr. Ray but also from contradictory testimonies from the officers on board Jack's aghast and it turns out that Lieutenant Grant and we'd gotten this kind of crazy letter that Grant had written in one of the earlier chapters, says that the ship they sunk was not a man of war, but a Dutch store ship. And Jack loses it. <laughs> I was really worried for Jack at this point because he's been in the situation before trying to speak about or try to avoid not speaking about a claim that he has to some prize or some honor. And he's been in the position before of being slighted by either an admiral or an admiralty official. And I'm reading this going, Jack, just keep your hair on. Just keep your hair on. And thank heavens, the admiral arrives. Admiral Dummett calls Jack away before Jack commits a grave indiscretion. Yes. And good news, tries to recruit Jack for this Baltic mission and convince Jack to captain a sloop, not realizing that Jack is already on the inside of this because he's heard about it from Stephen. Right, right. So, whew, the, we've headed off the danger of Jack braining somebody in the Admiralty. <laughs> and now action starts to take place that we've got people moving from point A to point B. Jack is sent off immediately with the King's Messenger to ride and catch the morning tide. The First Lord, no less, calls Jack in and thanks him for taking the mission and suggests that, oh, joy of joys, there could be a heavy frigate preparing for the North American station. And that's the plum that's being held out to, to Jack as a potential reward. And whether they do this cynically or not, we certainly know they've done this repeatedly. Jack's chosen to take on potentially questionable commands because he's promised a bit of a treat on the other side of it. Right. And And Mike, it struck me that the two things that we've got going on up to this point in the story, we've got Stephen making some kind of a quest, making some sort of struggle to find an accommodation with Diana and to find an accommodation with his current and former feelings for Diana. And Jack's struggle to get a ship as the means to honor and advancement. And they're both having those struggles, you know, set back and subverted and undercut. So we've got this theme all the way through. We're five chapters in now, and they've all been set back in in small but really sort of exhausting ways at every turn. Right, right. And I think Jack just no longer wants to be the scrub that he has fallen into being and wants to get himself back to being the man that he aspires to be and have the marriage he aspires to have. They've got to, um, you know, the king's messenger is going to pick them up shortly. So they run back to the grapes. Jack is starving because he doesn't know when the king's messenger is going to want to eat. And he thinks it might be later on the road. He, He doesn't want that. So he learns from Mrs. Broad that Stephen is upstairs meeting with a foreign young gentleman talking foreign 20 to the dozens. And and the girls are just kind of head over heels over this sweet young gentleman who I know is a, a particular favorite character for you. So let me, Ian, let me have you talk to us about who Stephen comes down with. So he comes back downstairs and introduces Jack to Mr. Yagiello. Now, Yagiello, he's a soldier. We're not given his rank, I don't think. He's described as a handsome gentleman with a girlish complexion. And he bows and blushes upon meeting Jack. And Jack's very happy to hear that they're going to be sailing together. And during O'Brien's favorite set piece, a dinner, we get this wonderful, wonderful introduction to Yagiello. I just think Yagiello's great. I love the way O'Brien introduces us to him. First of all, because it comes at exactly the right moment. We've been drawn down into the dark kind of intrigue of Jack and Sophie and Miss Smith and Stephen and Diana and the Admiralty. And what we really needed right now is somebody frothy and lightweight and fun and fascinating. (laughs) And that's exactly what we've got. Dead on time, we've got Yagiello. And I also love that in, in the writing, He's introduced to us quite economically, but it's really colourful. We get loads of information about his character, his blushing, um, his ability to draw the ladies. I mean, the the girls, the serving maids, like many other females, 
whom Yagyello will encounter in the in stories to come. The ladies are absolutely head over heels for the beautiful, charming, and, and very slightly flawed <laughs> Yagyello. So much so that Jack thinks he's going to have to entertain Yagyello and does does what every king's officer does with time to kill and a prestigious guest to entertain. Pours pints and pints of port wine into Yagyello. <laughs> And they end up singing. And I love the quote here. We've got this sort of arch and knowing tone to all of the description of Yagiello and Yagiello's uh, dialogue. And just at the moment when we hear Yagiello start to sing, O'Brien says, Now, after a proper reluctance, he obliged the company with the lady and death in a pure, true-pitched tenor. Nice. <laughs> I, I, th- Mike, I think O'Brien's got a man crush on Yagiolo as well. It's, he's just so sympathetically described. And maybe he's he is the idea of a naive but beautiful and charming man that O'Brien wishes he was once, or that maybe we all wish we once were. You know, he's good looking. He can sing. He can hold his liquor. Uh, women swoon over him. Um, he has faults and flaws and he says the odd strange thing, but they just seem to add to his charm. Boy, do the ladies love it. And he's so, I mean, we'll keep finding out multidimensional. There's always just a little bit, you know, right when you think that it's kind of this standard secondary character, you find out a little bit more. I, I just love this. Yeah, I think O'Brien does a great job with Young Yellow. <laughs> One thing we might do at this point is speculate, Mike, about... Where's our contemporary Yagiello? We've talked about uh, Spock and Kirk, or maybe Bones, McCoy and Kirk, as analogues for um, Jack and Stephen. I wonder who can be our contemporary Yagiello. And I was casting around, who do we know who's ridiculously good-looking, charming, has some flaws, um, but the ladies all seem to love him? And I thought, ridiculously charming, that's got to be Rob Lowe. And here are a couple of bits of audio that suggest that maybe the contemporary Yagiello is Chris Traeger from Parks and Rec. <laughs> this is the best possible job for me. I can literally make anything sound positive. Your house just burned down and you lost all your money in the stock market. It's a chance to start over. Fire is cleansing. And true wealth is measured by the amount of love in your life. If I had to have anybody tell me that I had cancer, I would want it to be me. Hello there. Hi. Chris Traeger. This is Ben. Well, hello, gents. Ron Swanson. Ron Swanson. Okay. I'm Deputy Director Leslie Nope. Leslie Nope. It is fantastic to be here. Would you gentlemen like a tour? Oh, there is quite literally nothing I would rather have in the world than a tour of the Parks and Recreation Department of the great city of Pawnee, led by Ron Swanson and Leslie Nope. Okay. Ben? I don't think that's a great idea. Let's do it. Okay. Chris is the most positive state budget auditing consultant I've ever met. I mean, I made eye contact with him, and it was like staring into the sun. So it's funny. I suspect that Yagiello might have come from a real character or a version of a real character that was known to Patrick O'Brien, and he's kind of a parody, almost a self-parody. And I'm pretty sure that Rob Lowe, playing Chris Traeger in Parks and Rec, is a, a parody of Rob Lowe himself, and that, that makes it all the funnier. Anyhow, time and tide wait for no man. Before the tide turns, Mike, I wonder if this might be a good opportunity for us to take a short break. It's a great idea. Anytime the king's messenger arrives, a break is called for. We'll be right back after this short interval. So there's something that we want to tell you all about the way that we're planning to develop the podcast going forward and give you new ways to get involved in the life of the podcast and help us out as well. We just announced on social media, several of you have seen it already and and come to our aid. We appreciate that, that we are now accepting patrons for The Lover's Hole. It's always going to be free to download. But if you would like to help defray some of the expenses of producing The Lover's Hole, we're now giving you an opportunity to do that easily and directly. And in return for your help, we'd love to offer you the chance to stay closely involved with the podcast, to get access to some patrons-only specials that we'll be creating, get the inside scoop on some of our materials and where the show's going next. We'd love it if you can get on board. You can find us and find out about the opportunities to help us out 
at patreon.com forward slash lubber's hole you'll know you'll have found the right place because you'll see our logo on our graphics right there there are loads of content creators on the internet who manage to engage with their audiences via patreon we're really happy that it seems to suit us and you our listeners really well so we hope that you'll enjoy participating with us in this way and that's patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash lovers all a glass of wine with all of you welcome back you're with ian and mike listening to the lovers hole the king's messenger has come in these three guys are well into their cups they have this long ride to uh, get to the ship. And uh, in the midst of this, it's funny. Yagello wants to get Jack to talk, but Jack's sound asleep and snoring. Stephen's off in his reverie. The King's Messenger's kind of, kind of reading and not looking at anybody. But they get there. They row out to the ship. And then Jack is in an absolute hurry to put to sea. And he, he literally chases the captain who is in the midst of a dinner party and dance with all their guests <laughs> over the side. <laughs> and, and he reads himself in. And, and it's been a while since we heard the read in like this, right? Oh, yes. And it's another classic Patrick O'Brien epithet. First of all, the words of the reading in which O'Brien seems to want to read to us like poetry with this really strong kind of historical martial overtone. And he even gives it the same adjective. He says, Jack read himself in a strong hieratic tone. <laughs> right. So this is great. We're back to Aubrey on a quarter deck, summoning the hands aft, reading himself in. You shall answer to the contrary at your peril, seems to be his favorite phrase. I love that phrase. And then he turns to the captain and says, I'm sorry to bundle you and your guest over the side, he said to the poor Mr. Draper. And then in a much louder voice, all hands to unmoor ship. Okay, here we go. <laughs> See you, bye. And we get this change of perspective, which O'Brien loves to, to give us sometimes. A uh, lieutenant and a master watching from a nearby ship see all the hurry and they see Jack leaving. And the lieutenant says, I'll lay you a bottle of port. We'll see some fireworks before he clears the mouse. Lucky Jack Aubrey, says the master. He always was one for the great guns. If, like me, you're wondering what the mouse is, <laughs> just just east of South End on the Sea, Check out Tom Horn's Cannonade.net mapping project of all, book by book mapping project of all the Matron and Aubrey journeys and locations. And as you follow along in the surgeon's mate, I think you just might need it. I know I did. It's great, isn't it? And I love the choice of location as well. This is an auspicious jumping off place right. for... Uh, exciting moments in the O'Brien canon. He's left from Portsmouth before. He's going to leave from Shelmerston on other occasions. He's left from basically the the, the Nor, the, the mouth of the Thames, on a few other occasions, including the famous chase across the Channel to cut out the Fanchilla in Post Captain. So the Nor, the Mouse, Deal, the Downs, the Goodwind Sands, these are places that have meant something to Jack Aubrey in the past. So it's an auspicious location, I think. Yet more reassurance, Mike, for those of us who are old Aubrey Maturin uh, circumnavigators, the real signal that we're back at sea and that Jack is in his right place is gunnery. Yes. And as as foretold by the lieutenant and the master, the crew know this is coming and they are absolutely terrified. It says they jumped to orders. They jumped to orders like they never had for Captain Draper. Even the, the first lieutenant, Lieutenant Hyde, was nervous and Jack is there large and silent and imposing. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, so Jack's escorting Yagyello and Stephen Below to take a quick turn around this ship that they've so suddenly taken possession of and uh, set to sea in. We always get early descriptions, I think, of the quality and character of a ship, and we're invited to figure out whether a ship is going to be a real character and a real part of the story, or whether she's just a conveyance. Um, we're not sure yet about Ariel, but we get some positive signs. She's described as beautiful, um, but also decidedly cramped. <laughs> This after Stephen and Jack have been on frigates and the occasional ship of the line in, in, in recent times. And we learn that Yagyello, just like Stephen, isn't really a seaman. And he strikes his head against a beam, bleeds profusely, and Jack decides that he's going to wait <laughs> to see if Yagyello is actually going to pull through from his head injury before he, Jack, goes back on deck for the gunnery. 
And when he gets back up, we, we do get here Jack reflect a little bit on how he does, in fact, love Ariel. It may not have an actual quarter deck or foxel, but he says that this is great. And he had actually chased her twice without success before England captured her from France. And now he gets to captain her. He thinks her 1632 pounders are a match for anything in her class, provided that she can get close enough because they're cannonades. And he notes that he is 20 men short and he does have a lot of boys aboard, but the ship seems to handle himself pretty well. But as you say, Ian, the real test is gunnery. And Jack knows that heading for the Baltic now, he could at any moment face Dutchmen, French, Americans, And so he wastes no time checking on their gunnery skills, just as they came, sure enough, to the mouse bank. (laughs) Jack has them firing at a crate on the starboard bow, and they did well. Thank heavens. We've grown used to the idea that crews that are new to Captain Aubrey get their gunnery exposed, and he has to make them anew in his own image. But fortunately, this particular crew seems to have pretty sharp gunnery. And we get the last lines of the chapter here, setting the tone for where Jack is at now that he's at sea. Jack gave the order, how's your guns? And said, a creditable exercise, Mr. Hyde. Went below smiling, his headache and his ill temper gone. And Mike, that's certainly the first time we've had a reference to anything like a smile on Jack Aubrey's face for a few chapters. Nothing like going to sea and a little good gunnery to ease a hangover and the worries of the world. We're on our way across the North Sea. And by the way, Mike, we've never been across the North Sea before. I, I think we understand that Jack might have been in one of his commands in the in the dead years <laughs> between Post Captain and Mauritius Command. But we've never been to the Baltic. We've never been to um, Scandinavia. So this is new territory for us as passengers aboard uh, Jack Aubrey's voyages. Right. We remember that we followed Stephen one time when Jack was off to the Baltic and he brought back that Norwell tusk <laughs> that reappeared again in Mauritius command. But we get to go with him this time. Yeah. And happily, all seems to be going well. The gunnery is getting better and better as the crew heads towards Denmark. Jack seems to feel good about how the crew are doing. Obviously, he hopes that the real shakedown might come, which would be action with an enemy. And it says in the text that Jack knew the attachment, even the affection that sprang up between men who had been through a serious sea fight together and that very valuable change in the relationship, a change that worked both ways. And even though naval custom ruled out much in the way of conversation between them, he means between the hands and the officers, the special relationship, the esteem was there. Jack's very happy to talk about this to Stephen as well. He goes straight to Stephen and says, this is more like a proper life for a man. And we get Stephen, I think, remarking that there's been this massive turnaround in Jack's fortune, not just his fortunes, but I think his mood and his temper. And O'Brien says he had rarely seen the change so strongly marked before. Yeah, yeah. Stephen's thinking, you know, Jack looks bigger. He acts just more capable in in strange and surprising situations and in the common daily routine. And like you say, this this idea that says, and even more so than ever before, we know that Stephen has seen Jack aboard ships for many, many years. So it's kind of a nice, nice place to find Jack at this point. Now, if this was a lesser author, Mike, I think we would have blown across the North Sea in a westerly gale and started to engage people on the shore somewhere and, you know, navigated perilous oceans. But O'Brien makes us take the time (laughs) to get back into the society that Jack is in. First of all, it's pleasing, I think, for Jack and Stephen to be among a whole crew again, which they've only been as, as passengers before. And we've got this great new character to get to know. We've got Yag Yellow, who has to get to know the world of being a sailor and has to get to know the particular sailors, the particular officers and men who are around him here on the aerial. Yeah, I, I think it's really going to be interesting. And and they, the journey that they're taking, to your point, is, is not straightforward. They've got a lot of twists and turns before they get to Grimm's home here. Uh, so and it's, you know, this whole idea about, gee, I'd like to see them in action I'd like to form this group up before we get to Grimm's home. We know that he's got to stop. He's got to get orders. We're kind of, it's, it's fascinating what's going to happen and that delightful knowledge that you've just passed on that we're also going to get to spend a little time aboard the ship for a while with Jack in command. 
It's going to be great, isn't it? In a way, Yagiello gets to follow the journey that Stephen Matchman followed way back in Master of Commander, being introduced to the environment and the working of the ship and expressing his own lubberly character as he finds his way around the rigging. Yagiello's not lacking in confidence, I think it's fair to say. Jack sees Yagiello, who's already fallen into the sea once, <laughs> up in the foremast cross trees. So that's not just the t- the four top, but the cross trees where the four top gallant mast starts. So right up, I'm waving my hands in the air here. Like he's a flipping long way up. And Jack sends a midshipman to fetch Yagiello, tells him to be sure to come down through the lubber's hole. And aren't we happy, Mike, to have him with us? Oh, thank you, welcome, and- Yagiello. <laughs> And Jack's afraid that Yagiello's going to break his neck being so high with presumably such indifferent skills and uh, and with not much seamanship to, to fall back on. He'd already fallen into the hold once when the hatchway was left open, saved by a heap of empty sacks. And he'd also been in the midst of other accidents caused by crew members. He's popular. So Yagiello's really making friends among the crew. He begged for mercy <laughs> for a crew member who not to be flogged. And he's such a shining light, I think, of naive, idiotic <laughs> goodness aboard the ship. He says he was cheerful, he wasn't afraid of anything, he was good company, and he's described as being an absurd beauty. And in loads of other situations, we've had O'Brien describing secondary characters aboard ship as providing this moment of beauty, the idea of this indefinable sweetness that just makes people nice to be around and valuable in the kind of course masculine, slightly ugly, scruffy world of being aboard ship. Well, and, and we get an example of a little bit of that scruffier part of it. Here's this guy who is is really brilliant, uh, even though he, he is bumbling as well. He proves to be really helpful with his Baltic connections and his language skills. But then sadly, we've got some of what O'Brien calls the stupider officers talking to him because he's a foreigner like he's a child and sadly lieutenant hyde is one of those so here's this guy who's a wizard at cards he's a wizard at chess he's a a linguist par excellence and and hyde as we see in the next dinner scene we always like the dinner scenes and this one happens to have a recurring o'brien motif watch this interaction here between hyde and young yellow (laughs) oh it's great as you say, Mike, the, the recurring O'Brien motif, the, the the flying entree, the flying main course. Hyde is cutting Yagiello's beef, and it's pretty old, pretty crusty salt beef that's been too long at sea. Hyde's cutting this beef for Yagiello because of his bandaged hand. And Yagiello, in pidgin English, points to the hand and asks Yagiello, I hope him not hurt too much, which is really, really patronizing. And as they're talking, the beef that Hyde is cutting shot into Jack's bosom with surprising force. Hyde is mortified at the incident. Jack says, you should certainly be hanged for directing a lethal weapon at a superior officer. And Hyde is quite embarrassed by this, turns to to Yagiello and says, another little divinity reference here, Mike, a little god's body, sir, a dog's body, I mean, in a low and melancholy voice. And Stephen notices, notices this kind of spooneristic tendency that Hyde has and the way he confuses left and right and wonders if the inversion of sounds and the inversion of space might be important in this person, especially, he says, at a time when the mind itself was confused. Right, right. So we've got this Hyde talking childishly to young Yellow, and we've got this, I, I love the flying entree, but a tough situation here. Stephen's pursuing this, but of course, rather than continuing, he turns the topic to sex. <laughs> and it, it's wondering, he said, you know, I know we can't talk about politics or religion, but I wondered about sex. And Jack says, well, I, I have heard described at a table before. And so Stephen um, continues on and he notes that they have this great sense of freedom and simplification on board. And he wonders, what would the ship be like if there were an equal number of men and women on it, just like on land? And here we get this Yagiello, who's the, the ladies are falling all over. Yagiello blushes and says, I know very little of women, sir. You cannot make friends with them. They are the use of the world. <laughs> He's got this, I don't even you know, JY thing going here. And, and Jack 
Jack can't help himself. He says, use Mr. Yagella, cried Jack, and to himself chuckling much, he added, it'd be a damned odd thing if they proved rams, you know. Yagella says, Jews, I, I, I mean, Jews. He says, you cannot make friends with Jews. They've been beaten and spitted upon for so long they are the enemy. Like the laconical helots, and women have been domestical helots and for oh so much longer. There is no friendship between enemies, even in a truce. They are always watching. And if you're not friends, where is the real knowledge? Some speak of love, suggested Stephen. Love, cried the young man. But love is a creature of time, whereas friendship is not your own, Shakespeare says. And they're, they're, they're cut off here, but they're cut off in the midst of this, this amazing kind of conversation. So we've got this... This, like you say, this comic relief, we've got a little society, and all of a sudden, a, to me, a really fascinating point about women, you know, have been downtrodden the way Jews have been downtrodden, and so how do we have a relationship? And so we've got this thing, you know, I remember Jeremy talking about O'Brien and his kind of his 60s or 70s kind of view on the 1800s, unfortunately cut short when a midshipman reports that there appears to be a, a Baltic convoy spotted up on the deck. It's strange, isn't it? I wanted the conversation to go on. I want to have dinner with Yagiello. I think he'd be fantastic company. <laughs> but maybe we're going to get some more later, because for now we have the Baltic convoy. So Jack and the officers go on deck. Stephen's being the diplomat. He passes on a message from Jack to Yagiello, as only Stephen can. Mind, he says to Yagiello, I must tell you I'm charged with a message to be delivered in a most tactful diplomatic way so that it does not in the least resemble an order, so improper to a guest, but so that it shall have an equivalent force and effect, he says. Your agility, he's talking to Yagiello, your agility in the upper rigging excites wonder and admiration, my dear sir, but at the same time it causes a very great uneasiness of mind, an uneasiness proportionable to the esteem in which you are held, and it would please the captain if you would confine yourself to the lower platforms, technically known as tops. Does he believe that I shall fall? asks Yagiello. He believes that the laws of gravity bear more severely on soldiers than on seamen. <laughs> And since you are a hussar, he's convinced that you will fall. Yagiello, very po-faced, very straight, says, I shall do as he wishes, of course, but he is mistaken. You know, heroes never fall, at least not fatally. <laughs> I was not aware, says Stephen, that you were a hero, Mr. Yagiello. <laughs> this is just a fabulous conversation. And it turns out only the star to it, you know, heroes never fall, at least not fatally. <laughs> and having said that, the aerial hits a stiff breeze and young yellow falls to the floor. <laughs> he gets his spurs caught in the matting. And, and, but still from the floor, he looks at Stephen and says, of course, I am a hero. He said, getting up and laughing very cheerfully. Every man is a hero of his own tale. Surely, Dr. Matron, every man must look on himself as wiser and more intelligent and more virtuous than the rest. So how could he see himself as the villain or even as a minor character? And you must have noticed that heroes are never beaten. They may be undone for a while, but they always do themselves up again and marry the virtuous young gentlewoman. Stephen replies, I've noticed it indeed. There's some eminent exceptions, sure, but upon the whole, I'm convinced you are right. Perhaps it is that which makes your novel or tale a little tedious. Dr. Batrid cried Yagiello, if I could find an Amazon, one of a tribe of women that have never been oppressed, one that I could be friends with, equal friends, oh, how I should love her, <laughs> Stephen replies. Alas, my dear, men destroyed the last Amazon 2,000 years ago, and I fear your heart must go virgin to the grave. <laughs> oh! And I, I think we, we don't get it clearly signed, posted to us, but I think Stephen's really enjoying this little verbal sort of fencing and dancing around act in this conversation with Yagiello. He's really enjoying the fact that he's got an equal in terms of or, or, you know, arcane flights of philosophy and the condition of man. Right. But this is also right to the heart of the Diana and Stephen relationship, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, they, they always do themselves up and marry the virtuous gentlewoman. 
Perhaps it is that which makes your novel or tale a little tedious. I wish I could find one of the oppressed, one of the Amazons that I could be friends with, equal friends. And this is like, this is the Stephen and Diana situation being analysed. And of course, Yug Yellow, I don't think, knows of Diana and don't, don't, certainly doesn't know of the connection between Stephen and Diana. No. But that gets right to the heart of the the difference between what Maturin wants and what Maturin thinks he might be able to get. And it really, to me, I'm really wondering, you you know, Young Yellow, you've done so many circumnavigations, and I'm coming back to this so many years later and going, wow, this guy just keeps presenting these amazing things, even as he's falling to the floor. There he is. <laughs> And I, I, you know, I just, I love this writing. I love the multitude of characters. I love, as you say, that rather than just across the North Sea, here we are in the midst of these kinds of conversations. And as they go into a game of chess, which I think they get into because dessert's not ready yet, and they think that dessert's a fair way off, we even have this commentary about how Yag Yellow and Stephen play chess together. And it says the game might not prove much about the intelligence of the players, but it provided certain evidence that Yag Yellow's virtue, or at least his kindness, was greater than Stephen's. Stephen playing to win had launched a powerful attack, and now Yag Yellow was wondering how he could play to lose, how he could make a mistake that would not be woundingly obvious to his opponent. And what a generous guy. <laughs> what a generous guy. Yag Yellow's chess, it says, was far beyond Stephen's. And his power of dissembling his emotions was not, and Stephen could see his expression of ill-assumed stupidity with some amusement. Oh, man, <laughs> what a fascinating person to spend some time with. Layers and upon layers here. Stephen, you know, after this witty repertoire back and forth, basically challenges him with the chest to say, well, basically you figure out who's the wiser, more intelligent person. Young Yellow says, ah, there's another virtue here that I've got that uh, I'm going to make this thing through. And, and we're struggling in the midst of this when Jack walks in with this huge plum cake. So they'd heard a boat launch. They'd heard a boat come back. That was why they were thinking, OK, uh, it looks like dessert's going to be um, delayed. So here's this huge plum cake. And he's got these two hands behind him. And they've got things, wine and food. People were bringing sheep in. And, and Jack explains to him that one of the merchantmen that they saw in this big convoy has now filled their coffers until they get to Gothenburg. You know, they hadn't been able to do this. They had left in such a tearing hurry. They're sitting there eating ship's biscuit. Now they've got all this stuff. And Young Yellow takes advantage of this. It says, with a look of relief, instantly move the board to make room for the cake, solving his problem by upsetting all the pieces. So he knocks the chessboard over to give Matron a way out after Matron's doing his dead level best to beat him and can't, and Young Yellow can't figure out how to lose gracefully. I love this. It sets up this expectation that on the one hand, everything he does makes us smile. And everything he does is also slightly irritating because he's proving to... I mean, Stephen is kind of the hero of the stories, certainly at the moment, because Jack is in, in his doghouse of bad sexual morality. <laughs> However well-intentioned and philosophical and generous you think you may be able to be on a good day, Yag Yellow can be better intentioned, more philosophical and more generous. And that's the kind of person that gets hit sooner or later, I think. We've got an interview coming up soon with Rachel McMillan. And, you know, I know she's an author who loves O'Brien's deep character development. And, and he writes, she writes her own novels in that same way. I, you know, I can't wait to hear what she thinks about scenes like this. So it's funny, we haven't had a, a storm, we haven't had naval action, we haven't had Lose Not a Minute. We've just had a cruise across the North Sea in the company of Yag Yellow. And it feels like we've, we've, we've covered a lot of territory. But now finally we're in Gothenburg and maybe we can wrap up, Mike, with with just a look around the horizon in Gothenburg and uh, and what's available here. We get another example of the very cinematic, very visual prose of Patrick O'Brien and our friend Eva Sandor, I think, talked a bit about this. It says, Gothenburg, a melancholy town, most of it quite recently burnt, inhabited by tall, spare melancholiacs dressed in grey wool, much given to drinking and self-murder, but kind to strangers if not to themselves. The commandant at once provided powder, best red-letter cylinder powder, together with a present of smoked reindeer's tongues and a barrel of salted honey buzzards. These he gave to Stephen, saying, Pray accept this small keg of buzzards. And on that burning note, we leave our heroes. 
I think we probably do. We've got to find out next time, Mike. What's with the buzzards? Are they cocktail stirrers or are they for cleaning shoes or do you actually eat them? Right. And, and is there really such a thing as a honey buzzard? A honey buzzard? You know? We've got to find out what's happened as they get closer to the mission of trying to recapture Grimm's home and try to convince Ramondo Astret to come over to the side of Britain and her allies. Yes. You know, we, we still have this Diana and Stephen thing. We have this Sophie and Jack thing. We've got Kimber. And while we seem to be revving up towards Grimm's home, we wonder, is that it? Is that really the point of the book? And by the way, who or what is the surgeon's mate? And of course, can Yagiello continue to be this perfect without somebody hitting him? <laughs> That's right. And... And to a call out to all of our great friends on the Aubrey Matron Facebook Appreciation Society, the buzzards, can they be yet? Can they? I wonder. The only way to find out, Mike, is to turn another page. What do you say to a bit more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, with all my heart, Ian. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm I'm trying desperately to turn off you know, my phone. Whereas Sir Joseph's trying desperately to turn on. Yeah, exactly. That was the 60s for you. <laughs>